Hello everyone and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at PureMTGO.com where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show, from YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 150 of the Common Knowledge Podcast. I'm your host, Christian, and I'm joined by our co-host, Brad. Hello, everybody. Before we got too far into this episode, I just want to remind everyone that Common Knowledge and all of the podcasts on the Constructed Criticism Network are sponsored by PureMTGO.com. If you'd like to support the show, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the Constructed Criticism YouTube channel, and check out our podcast on Patreon, where you'll find stuff like pre-show, um, sometimes weekly solo shows, things like that. That's over at patreon.com slash common knowledge. Out of the way, let's get on with the podcast for the week. Woohoo! How have you been, sir? I feel like it's been a, been a little while, been a hot minute, as they say. You know, for the past week and a half or so, honestly, I haven't been doing the best mentally. But that's okay. Coming out the other end of it. Good deal. Um, I don't have a voice at this exact moment. There was a show that I went to last night, and today, instead of resting my vocals afterwards... I just continued to talk a lot. <laughs> so, yep. We're going to make it through tonight. Push through the pain. And hopefully, yeah, then hopefully not talk tomorrow at work. Yep. That's always the goal, not talk at work. <laughs> just just hide away yeah. in the in the closet in the corner and not talk to anybody. How yeah. was the uh, show? I don't think I asked you that in the pre-show. Now, were these bands that you knew about, or were you just like, I need to go to a show tonight, and I'm going to pick the first one that, that comes up? Yeah, so the headliner... It's a band called The Wonder Years. They're probably one of my favorite pop punk bands. They were doing like a 10 year anniversary show oh, okay. for the album that kind of like put them on the map. Mm-hmm. Where they were just playing the album front to back. And then the band, another band that they came with, Spanish Love Songs, this sort of like a newer band that's picking up a lot of popularity now. So I knew those two. And there was two other bands that I knew of, but had never listened to that are also on the tour. So it was okay. a healthy mixture of both, you know. I got introduced to some new stuff and some stuff that I knew I would be satisfied with. Right on. That's always a good show. I like discovering new bands as I hear them live. That's always a fun, yeah. fun time. <clears throat> yeah, I always um like if I like go to a show, I'm like the one of the people that's like always buying merch. Right. <laughs> so like normally what I'll do is is like whenever I get there, you know, somebody with me always has an egg on them. So it's like I'll buy like a shirt or something for one of the bands that I know. Mm-hmm. But then out of the bands that I didn't know that I liked the most, I always buy something from their merch table as well. Okay. Towards the end. Yeah. Yeah. That's very supportive so, of you. That's, that's good to call. I like it. Yeah. It's also just like a reminder of like, if I have a t-shirt of this band that I really liked, I'm actually going to commit to listening to them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Instead sort of, of they, just uh, like think about them sometimes. Hold yourself accountable sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to wear the shirt if I don't know the song. No. Because like, what if be somebody would come up to the street? Yeah, somebody was like, I bet you don't even know three of their songs. So I want to be able to prove them wrong. Yep. I know 12 <laughs> of them. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. I know this no, I one album that. one year that they toured. <laughs> right. I saw them live. Shut up. Yeah. Right. No, oh, that's good times. I haven't what been about to a you, live buddy? show in a while. I miss live shows. Hopefully, um, Megadeth Nashville 2022. Hopefully, I'll get down there for that one. That'd be awesome. Oh, yeah. It'll be a great time. Yeah. I had a bunch of them bunch of shows canceled obviously in the last couple of years but i get it yeah but i need to get back on the concert circuit i miss some miss live shows but no i've been pretty good uh had all those pc problems where my hard drive and or motherboard just stopped i mean i'm not super familiar with pcs but is is that the technical jargon for it they just stopped they just noped they were just done <laughs> yeah. i don't know Retired, what happened maybe. yeah they were just they just didn't wake up so I had to get a new one sort of on the fly and I'm much happier with it. It's better performing. Like we sort of chatted about, it's a solid state hard drive over a regular hard drive. I up the Ram, the memory a little bit. Um, and so far so good. Granted, this is the first night I've actually put it to any sort of use, but, um, everything's installed. I get MTGO, all the recording stuff, audacity, OBS, all that good stuff, discord. So it's pretty much back to the state it was before I lost it. Lost the other one, so we'll see how it goes. But outside of that, no, i just been working, dealing with the routine Wednesday, Thursday, snow, ice, rainstorms we've been getting for the past month or so, three weeks. 
And then uh, that's pretty much about it. Hanging out, hanging out at the house. Yeah. Well, that's sort of what's been going on with you outside of the magic world. Yep. Have you been able to get out and play any more magic? I have. I spent a little bit of time towards the end of this past week or the end of this week, I guess, playing a little bit on NTGO because I finally had a working computer again. And I get on with my laptop every now and then, but it kind of sucks. It's mainly for work, so it's not like a high-performance machine or anything. So I try not to play on that a whole lot. But yeah, I got on there and played. I don't know if you remember me talking about when I went to Kansas City and played with Derek and Nate from Land Say Go. Derek's been really big. Ever since then, he's just been brewing pauper decks like in in their discord and the land say go discord just one or two decks a day he's like he'll he'll send me a question like hey does this deck exist and i'm like no nah, not really or it does but it's unplayable or whatever and then like 10 minutes later he sends me two lists like man this is awesome he gets deep you know like deep deep dives on these cards too i don't know where he comes up with them but so back to what i was talking about playing online he came up with this sort of like domain snow domain sort of like grindy mid-range deck that I was playing around with and it's pretty fun it struggles online because it's really slow it's sort of like I'm not going to do anything until turn three or four and online is not the meta where you can not do anything until turn three or four so right. but other than that it's a hell of a deck it's really fun and then, so I played a little bit of that, a little bit of Mono Black Rogues, a little bit of Burn. I don't know, I just dabbled in a bunch of different decks while I while I had the time. And then yesterday, I did go to the to Bodax for their Saturday afternoon pauper. Got my butt whooped real big, real bad. We had four people show up, which is kind of sad, but, you know, we had enough to get a little round robin going. Everybody was like, oh, cool, you know, we got enough. We'll just have a little casual tournament. You know, it's cool. We'll just play whatever. So I'm like, all right, you know, I if it was going to be like a decent turnout, I was going to play the new Boros Burn, Boros Frenzy deck that's been floating around. But it was just going to be like us four. So I thought, oh, I'll just play something I've been wanting to play since everyone's sort of like nonchalant about it. And so I busted out Reality Acid and everyone else played aggressive and or combo decks. So I got my butt whooped real fast, real quick. So um, I think it took me longer to drive to the shop than my entire tournament lasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But one, there was one sweet deck there. Um, one of my Twitter buddies showed up. He was on Black White. I don't know what the name of it is, but I just call it like Cleric's Life. It's like an infinite life deck based off Black White Clerics. It's sort of a deck that's been around for a while based around like the um, the White Clerics. And, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that interaction, if you've seen it before or anything. It uses Nomads Encore, which is a single white mana for a 1-1 core soldier creature. And it says zero. Its activated ability is zero colon. The next one damage that would be dealt to Nomads on core this turn is dealt to target creature you control instead. So that seems pretty benign on the surface, I think. But then when you pair that with, say, a Daru Spiritualist, which is one and a white for a 1-1 one, one Cleric, whenever a Cleric you control becomes the target of a spell or ability, it gets plus zero plus two until the end of turn. So the Nomads, the zero mana cost, prevent the next one damage is an ability you target any of your clerics and since it's worded to where it's the next one damage that's stackable so you can do the next one damage a thousand times and target cleric you control gets plus zero plus one thousand until the end of turn right and then you devour flesh it where you sacrifice it you gain life equal to its toughness and that's pretty much game over. <laughs> I mean, I guess unle sweet. unless they're running Infect or Mill, like super like Turbo Fog or something, <laughs> right? It's pretty much game over. Yeah, Blue and he was also infect. running. Um, this is a card I completely forgot about. It was Severed Strands from Ravnica Guilds of Ravnica. Ravnica. It's a one in a black for a sorcery as an additional cost to cast this spell. Sacrifice a creature. You gain life equal to the sacrificed creature's toughness. And then you can destroy a target creature opponent controls. So it's sort of dev devour flesh plus an additional destruction. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, that deck was hella fun to lose to. I thought it was pretty sweet. I definitely have not seen that deck ever. I knew it sort of existed. Like I knew that interaction between the clerics existed. 
but I've never seen anyone play the deck or attempt to play it or brew it or anything. Right. So that was pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah, man. Sounds like a good time. Yeah, it was a good time. We got to hang out, um, play some popper. I played some matches outside of the tournament, which was fun. Busted out Jun Cascade. I lost two goblins, but we didn't sideboard. So yeah, and just some handful of games here and there. Played some other decks, this and that. Um, what about you? Any, any magic for you? <laughs> yeah, recently I've been playing uh, much magic. Like I mentioned earlier, I've been super just not feeling great. So, you know, whenever I've had free time, I've spent it mostly just like being incredibly lazy and unproductive because that's like <laughs> sort of like what happens whenever I start to spiral. All right. But yep. I have been playing a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel on my phone because of that. Yeah, I saw you tweet um, something about it recently. Now that I'm feeling better, I really want to hit plat one. I'm like plat three right now. So just have two more rank ups to go. I've been playing probably like the easiest deck to play in the game called Eldlich. I've like really not played Yu-Gi-Oh before. Mm-hmm. But everybody was like, this deck is easy, it's perfect for beginners, and it's really good. Is it a pretty, easy, pretty easy game to, to pick up on the digital client? The game is? has a lot going on. Mm-hmm. But with Eldlich, there's not a lot going on. Okay. Sweet. And it's like, yeah, it's like playing like mono white control in Magic, yeah. where like all your deck does is Wrath and gain life. And it's like all this deck does is like stop what your opponent is doing mm-hmm. and then like put this insane card into play. And all of your cards go get other cards to just snowball advantage. Yeah, so it's like the deck is pretty straightforward. And as I've learned Yu-Gi-Oh, the deck has gotten better. So it's like a deck a beginner can play. And mm-hmm. as you get better, you're going to know like, oh, I shouldn't time this card right now. I should time it a little bit down their combo chain or whatever. All right. But it's like because of the way that the cards work, like it's perfectly fine to stop them at the beginning of the combo and you win a lot of games that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a very fun game. I've been entirely free to play the entire time I've played it, nice. which is awesome yeah. that I'm playing like what's considered one of the best decks in the game. For free. And yeah, exactly. Entirely free to play. Like I played maybe one day just like with like the starter decks. Mm-hmm. And then I had enough gems or whatever to obtain all the cards I needed. Very cool. Very cool. I haven't played it yet. I haven't dived into that, but I've seen a lot of tweets pretty much about that that last sentiment you had there about the free to play. You have a pretty good selection of decks, some very strong decks, and still also just free to play. Yeah, that's sort of what we've been doing. I guess we can go ahead and um sort of get into announcing our decks of the month for March. Yep, good timing. March starts in what two days from the date of recording. Something like that. Yeah, I think on Tuesday, something yeah. like that. I think I'm going to start off with, I haven't decided which version yet, but I'm going to pick a tier two-ish deck. I'm going to go with a Rakdos Madness build. There are two different lists I'm sort of waffling between. One of them actually, show, I believe, shows up in the 5.0 deck dump that we're going to get to a little bit later. And then one was posted in the um, Popper Guild Discord. It's cool as well. I have it almost completely built in paper. It's nearly identical, except for it's just a little grindier. Bigger creatures, slower creatures, um, that sort of thing. So I may right. play the grindy one in, in paper in person and the faster one online. But for purposes of the show, I'll probably stick to the quicker one because that seems better online, at least against the online meta. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's where I'm going to be sitting for the next three or four weeks. What about yourself? Yeah, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I was trying hard not to pick this heart type. Um, I picked Teamer. This might just end up being my deck of the year at this point. It's a good deck. The reason I went ahead and actually picked it this month, though, is when I was kind of going through my mental funk. One of the things that kind of got me out of it was um, owner of the Constructive Criticism Network, Spencer, reached out to me, and we had a really long chat. And basically, like, I was feeling much better after the chat. And then a couple of days later, like, we were just texting back and forth. And we had agreed that we're going to play a popper challenge together this upcoming weekend. And it's like the deck him and I were talking about the first time that we planned to do this. And the deck mm-hmm. that, like, we had both been testing was a bunch of different versions of Teamer. Right. So it's like now that we actually have agreed on a challenge to play together, it would be weird to not play the archetypes <laughs> we worked on together. Right. So yep. there's also... Another reason I wanted to do it is there's a bunch of different ways to build it. So I think it, there's going to be a lot to talk about at the end of the month. I think so too. Just I have not played the deck yet, but just hearing you talk about it and 
watching some of the pictures you've posted in the He's a media discord for teamer for those color combina- combinations. It seems like a pretty toolboxy type deck. Like you can sort of build it to suit your mood, suit your needs. The sideboard seems really flexible. You know, you're not locked into necessarily one or two strategies. Yeah. You can just sort of go any direction with it. Yeah. Cause you can build it as a ramp deck. You can build it as like a blue red control deck. That's just playing green for win conditions. Right. You can play it as like a blue green control deck. That's playing red for ramp as funny as it sounds. Right. Yeah. It's, there's so many different ways you can go with it. It's a lot of fun to work on. And like a lot of the core concepts are somewhat similar. So mm-hmm. like, it's not like you're starting over like you do with some other archetypes whenever you start to change them. Sure. Now, as far as Popper goes, do you think the the build that you and him have settled on for this teamer deck is is it probably the most optimal for the format? Like the strategy you're going with, uh-huh. you know, with this particular deck? I don't know. I'm really pushing for us to play the land destruction build. I don't know if that's optimal, right. but I definitely know for how my brain works. I have a really good understanding of how that deck works. Okay. That being said. It's not every day I consider Spencer a very high caliber player. Well. And it's not every day like you get to play with someone of his ability. Sure. So I might just whatever build he wants to play, go with it <laughs> just so I can learn more. You yep. know? Now is that gonna be the the first challenge in March, like next weekend? It'll be the second one because it'll one? be on Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Good deal. We'll have to keep our eyes out for that one. Are you gonna stream any of it or or is that too much to, to deal with while you're playing a challenge? I have considered streaming it like in the discord okay it'll definitely be recorded and put on patreon yep i probably won't do any editing it'll just be straight up yeah just raw video cuss words and middle fingers and table flipping and all that good stuff yeah yeah Yeah, exactly exactly. yep i'm probably gonna sort of sort of like you alluded to with that deck i'll probably spend the first two to three weeks of the month you know, the first week, obviously, just getting used to the deck again. It's been a while since I played a Madness deck at all, really. The second week, just jam in the tournament practice room, seeing how I feel at the end of that second week. If I need a third week in the tournament practice room, I'll take it. But if not, I'll probably spend the, the latter half or the last week of the month trying to do some leagues with it and see where we go. Maybe a challenge if I feel up to it. Yeah, so that's kind of where things stand going into the month. But, you know, I think our last episode was the Kamigawa set review. Yep. So what that means is we need to go over the most recent Popper League deck dump. Yeah, let's see where our meta is at. We had a ban about a month ago, big time ban. First League dump after that ban was a little tricky. It had like 40 something decks, 47 decks, I think I want to say in it. But a lot of those consisted of decks that had the banned cards in them that had already hit 5-0 before the ban announcement. And then I think the week after that, there was 38 or 40. The next week was high 30s. And it, it, it's going down a little bit, but that's understandable as you get further into a, a season as decks coalesce, players coalesce, that sort of thing. But we're still at 34 decks, and I think that's that's pretty good. That's still much higher than we've been any other time in the last year or so. So... Looks good to me. Uh, like you said, sort of in the pre-show, I don't know if we're going to talk about every single deck, you know, all 34 decks. We'll probably just let you know that what archetypes are here, the common ones, the big players, that sort of thing, and then just highlight a couple decks each that we that we thought were pretty cool. The common ones, pretty much what you would expect. Yeah. A few different Tron lists, which I really like that, you know, there's a few different ways to build Tron. They're all Pretty similar from what I saw. Mm-hmm. Denrova Horror is back, baby. Exactly. Yep. Now there's some familiars decks, some different fairies decks. There's like the wildfire control decks. You have your aggro, like burn, slivers, kiln fiend, aggro combo. Yeah, it's nice to see a slivers but, deck in the 5 especially an Abzan one. You don't see Abzan very often. This is actually the paper version I have built. It uses Crypt Sliver instead of like the mm-hmm. red ones, like the Heart Sliver, not Heart Sliver, but blade back sliver and all that good stuff that's a deck that there's a bunch of different ways to build i think yeah for sure seen. yeah definitely the naya version that had the blade back and all that stuff in it that was mainly when tron was like the dominant stonehorn force in the format and blade back let you get that that damage without combat so yeah you know that's like i said all the normal stuff is there i don't know exactly what decks you wanted to highlight i have two in mind that I was very pleased 
ended up in this tech dump kind of this late into the season. Yeah, I've got three for sure. The two of them are the t- very first two decks on the list, and then one's a little further down. So I don't know how you want to go about it. If you want to take turns or just rattle them off or whatever, but um, the first one that I wanted to lead with is it's listed as Azorius Control. Really, it's like Ephemerate slash Reanimator, or I guess yeah, like Evoke Ephemerate. So they're playing four Spirited Companion, which is the new Neon Dynasty card. Um, it's just the one-one dog. Whenever it ETBs, draw a card for two mana. Mole Drifter, Soul of Migration, you know, everything that you would expect from the Ephemerate late to dinner package. Mm-hmm. But then they're also playing four of Mirror Shell Crab. Solid. So, you know, sort of what we had talked about when this card is spoiled, you know, late to dinner in this back seems like it is pretty viable. You know, I really like that the core concepts of this deck didn't change much. Right. Just a little bit of the creature package. Two, yeah. It got two new toys mm-hmm. that it appears are doing really well in it. Yeah, absolutely. A spirited companion is showing up as a staple already in boggles lists. I'm glad to see it in an actual control list like this as well. And yeah, like you said, mirror shell crab is just, it's just hard to deal with. Like I, I lost to a reanimator deck with mirror shell crab, you know, they can channel it to counter or, you know, stifle whatever you're trying to do. And then the next turn, just reanimate it. And then the, they've got a huge creature on board and what do you do? Right. You know, <laughs> super strong. I'm glad that, this archetype remained good and it continues to get new cards. The only thing I am confused about on the list are the Azorius Signets. It's playing three of them. I was literally just looking at that card. Yep. Yeah, because my whole thing is, is like, it doesn't seem like you would Azorius Signet over like counterspelling or playing Spirited Companion or, you know, Journey to Nowhere on turn two. Mm hmm. So it's like, if literally every other two drop you have, you would rather play over your two mana ramp, then I don't think you should play your two mana ramp, I guess is sort of my point. Yeah, I can understand that. It's a it's a decent flex spot to sideboard out games two and three. And then two, I guess, since it's not the Jeskai late to dinner build, they don't really have that wildfire ramp package. So maybe that's supposed to take its place. I'm not really sure. But for sure, it's a sweet deck. I like the Jeskai version. I'm sure I'd like this too. It looks like we have a non-familiars blue-white control list in the meta that does pretty well. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. What do you think of um, Hindering Light there in the sideboard? The one of, uh, it's a blue and a white instant counter target spell that targets you or a permanent you control, and then you draw a card. That like literally never sees play, but it seems pretty spicy here. I think it's good, like... Your opponents can't like journey to know where your Archaeomancer because that's something that this deck can do, right? Is like um out of the sideboard or not out of the sideboard, but like it can kind of combo Archaeomancer and all of your other, you know, big ETBs with Ephemerate, just like the other Ephemerate decks can. Yep. So, you know, the fact that Hindering Light kind of comes in as a protection for your Archaeomancer and your other stuff in those slower matchups. So it's gonna function as a counterspell in the way that you would use a counterspell in those matchups. Right. And it's card neutral. You know, it's going to keep getting you through your deck. I think it's fine. It might not be the best card that could be there, but, you know, it's not like I hate it. You know, like yeah. I can see the kind of decks that it comes in against, and I know why it's good in those matchups. Yeah, and I think one of them is the perfect number, probably. But yeah, shout out to right. PFP All-Star Spike Boy for getting a 5-0 with Azorius Control. Excellent. Yeah, and the only other one that I saw that as soon as I read it, I was like, all right, I feel like I need to <laughs> speak about this deck. Uh-huh. It's just called Ephemerate Tron. Yep. Yeah, we kind of looked at this one during the pre show. I just wanted to point it out. I know a lot of people from the Tron and after the band were kind of worried about the deck, but you know, it can still put up really good league results. Probably never going to be as dominant as it used to be. I know that you and I have talked about this at least privately in the past. But, you know, this is just the straight up Tron deck. You know, it's playing Mirror Shell Crab, it's playing Simic Signet, Isaac Signet, and a few different types of either fixing or ramp. This is very much like 2019, 2018 Tron before all the Modern Horizons shenanigans and Bonders ornaments and all that stuff. Yeah. And the only reason I wanted to point it out is just because 
you know, I know I mentioned that Tron is big in the meta again with a few different ways to build it, but the Tron that people knew and got attached to is also still around. Right. And so I just wanted to highlight that for maybe people that were feeling down and out about the format, like, Hey, maybe there's something that you can go off here. Yep. Absolutely. I think it's great. Yeah. I don't think there's much more to say about it. We don't need to go over the list there. They're also running in, is it Signet? But, but yeah, it's old school Tron. It's awesome. This is probably the third or fourth different Tron build we've seen put up a 5-0 since the Bonders Ornament ban, I think. And that's a really good sign for this archetype, or at least for the for the 12 lands that produce a bunch of mana. I like it. I'm a fan. Now, what about you, my friend? I did. I had three, two for sure I wanted to talk about, and one that we've seen before, but I just kind of want to see what they're going, what they're doing with it. The first one is the very first one at the top. It's um, piloted by a Morez 27. Goldfish has it labeled as Mono Black Burn with a whopping eight ticks in price. It's awesome. But basically this one, you would think it would be like the Mono Black Rogues, which is more of what we've come to call Mono Black Burn is the Rogues build with Morsel Theft and all that stuff. This one is not really like that at all. The only creatures in this deck are three Crypt Rats, unless you count the four Okiba Reckoner Raid Saga that turns into a creature later. But other than that, it's just 31 burn spells, basically. It's Bump in the Knights, Fruit of Tezzerus, Sign and Bloods, um, Soul Reaps, which is not one you see a whole lot. It's the one in a Black Sorcery you can destroy a target non-green creature. Its controller loses three life if you played another black spell this turn. So it kind of functions as a burn spell. Sovereign's Bite for some life gain and more burn. Tyrant's Choice. Vampire's Kiss. Alms of the Vein. And um, like I said, the four Okiba Reckoner Raid Sagas. And then four Contaminated Grounds in the main board, which I'm absolutely a fan of. It's the one in the Black Enchantment, and it turns Enchanted Land into a Swamp, and whenever that land becomes tapped, the controller loses two life. Pretty awesome. Straight up 18 lands, four Piranha Marsh. Yes, that's right. Piranha Marsh comes in, does one damage to target player. So four of those. Two Rectos Carnarium. There's no red in the deck, but it helps ramp out some, some of the two and three drop spells a little easier. And then 12, 12 Swamps. And then pretty much a Mono Black Control, Sideboard, Kumbaj Witches, Guest Verdict, Trespasser's Curse, and Choking Sands. So yeah, I think I ran through that pretty quick, but just a bunch of really cool Mono Black Burn spells, Life Gain, some cards we don't ever see played, which is awesome, and Crypt Rats. <laughs> it's like the cherry on top. Maybe, maybe this is going to be deck of the month one of these upcoming months because this is awesome it, it is awesome it, the mono black rogues deck is one of my favorites but this just looks sweet like i've tried so many times to make rakdos burn a thing which uses like most of these black spells plus lightning bolts and blightnings and terminates and stuff this just pretty much cuts the red and gets down to business you know what i'm saying yeah so that is awesome and i can't believe they 5 would with four piranha marshes in their deck that is right. that is fantastic, <laughs> and with um, so what else did you have? On so your really, list? with two Carnariums, you have six Piranha Marshes. Right. It's awesome. Good job, Amores. Actually, the very next one down is probably going to be my deck of the month, Rakdos Burn by Bingo Baby Twenty Two. This one is um, seems a lot faster than the other version I had in mind. I'll just kind of run down it real quick. Of the creature package, we have a total of eight. We have four Voldaren Epicures that create a blood token and do a damage. And then we have four Kitchen Imp MH2 All-Star that madnesses for a single black, and it has flying and haste, and it's a 2-2. Two -two. One of the coolest creatures that Popper got from that set, I believe, in my opinion. 31 spells. Most of them are madness spells or just straight up burn to the face. We have Bump in the Night. Faithless Looting, obviously, any Madness deck needs Faithless Looting. Four Galvanic Blasts, four Lightning Bolts, three Deadly Disputes, two Soul Reaps, Soul Reap again, uh, four Vampire's Kiss, four Alms of the Vein, four Fiery Temper, and then we get into the Artifacts, um, non-land Artifacts, just two Blood Fountains creates Blood Tokens. Those tokens definitely trigger or can synergize with Madness very well. And then a whole bunch of Artifact lands in the mana base of 19. There's Drossforge Bridge, Great Furnace, Vault of Whispers, and then some Mountain Swamps and Carnariums. 
And then this pretty standard black and red sideboard, except for Psychotic Haze, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it's just a one of, but it's an instant for two and two black, where Psychotic Haze deals one damage to each creature and each player, or you can madness it for one and a black. So it's like a black electricery. Pretty sweet. But yeah, this one seems a lot faster, a lot more burn oriented, or, you know, straight to the face sort of oriented. Um, as opposed to the other list I, ha I had thought about, which was combat-oriented. So I'll probably play this one. Seems a little faster, and I'm a fan of fast decks. <laughs> right. Don't have the patience. Why play one league when you can play two? That's right. Why spend three hours playing one league when I can jam three? <laughs> exactly. So, But yeah, and that, that was an, uh, going back to Reality Acid. That was another thing about that deck, is it just, I played a little bit of it. I had sort of brewed with Derek from Lansego, this mono blue quote unquote land destruction deck with like boomerangs and eye of nowhere and all this stuff that bounced permanence. And it just was not doing what I wanted it to do. And after like four matches that I kept losing, I'm like, I want, I, I pretty much told myself like, I want this deck to be reality acid. So why don't I just play reality acid? You know, right. <laughs> like I, so for some reason I was trying to brew reality acid when that deck already exists, but yeah, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop your train of thought right there. Uh -huh. Yeah. If you take, go one step further, you're going to be playing a like blue, red Fay and for on and stuff. <laughs> stop. Just, just slow down right there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, reality acid is a blast. It's super slow. Like you don't do anything till turn three or four, but uh, once you do, if they don't stop you, it's just, it's game over for them. And then I had one more on the list down, way down at the bottom. USP Dudes, or USP Dudes, uh, 5 owed with a Is It Serpentine Curve list. And I have been a fan of these decks ever since Serpentine Curve came out in Strixhaven. I love these decks. I put one together in paper, like, right away. And this is another one sort of like, I don't want to say sort of like the Teamer deck you're playing, but... It's pretty much just a pile of whatever blue and red spells you can find. Whichever blue and red spells yep. you like, <laughs> you know, just throw them together. As long as you've got four serpentine curves and four pieces of the puzzle, you got a deck, pretty much. Right. So, but he's running four Augur Abolus, or they are running four Augur Abolus and one Underworld Rage Hound for their creature package. And everything else is just... There's snow lands and scred in the package and then just everything else you can think of. So it's yeah. pretty awesome. It doesn't vary too greatly from the ones we've seen in the past, but they were, I think it's been probably since the summer, maybe before the summer, since we saw a 5-0 serpentine curve list. And I am a huge fan of those. So I just wanted to point that one out. If you're looking for a fast deck that can also turn into a grindy deck if you need it to for game two or three, two and three. That's definitely one to, to take a look at. It plays like a blitz deck because there's so many spells, uh, so much interaction, but at the same time, you know, you can grind it out to turn 10, turn 12. It, it'll play like a, like a scred deck if you want it to. So pretty cool. I like it. I guess that's just going to do it for this episode of Common Knowledge. I think so. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find me on Twitter at JustGuyDad. Brad, where can they find you? At Popper underscore B on Twitter or Brad Drag V on MTGO. Or you can meow. Meow. <laughs> right. If you want to hear a really good meow, check out our Patreon. Free yeah, show for this that episode. Was it was good. Top tier. S tier meow. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, you can find us both at commonknowledgemtg at gmail.com. If you have any questions on the Popper format, MTGO or anything else, again, just email us or leave a comment down below. Thanks again to our sponsor, PureMTGO.com, as well as the Constructive Criticism Network for letting us be a part of it. And last, certainly not least, thank you for listening. Rest your voice the day after a concert. Take very good care of each other. And never stop brewing. Brewing.